Ladies and gentlemen, before we get started with the featured episode that I know you're excited to see, I just want to take a moment to tell you about Warrior MBS. That stands for Mind, Body, and Soul. This is a program that men from all walks of life have joined. Guys that want to level up in their mental clarity, their physical fitness, or their spiritual grounding. And they want to do it in a community of like-minded believers. So here's the, here's the deal. You got to be a Christian. You have to be a man, a biological man. There are no pronouns spoken within Warrior MBS. And you have to be a freedom fighter in the sense of you're fighting for the faith and freedom of your children, yourself, your family. Now it can be for any freedom fighting Christian man across the globe. Now, I want to show you the website real quick because this is going to explain it. So guys, here's the website. Now, let me draw your attention to this. April 1st, 2023 is our next round. So we're going to get started soon. And right up here, there's a join the group tab, which you can join at any time as long as you meet the qualifications. However, many of you would have questions about something like this. So there's the talk with Jeremy. That's me button. It links you directly to my calendar and you can schedule a 15 minute call to vet me, to vet the program, to see if it's a fit for you. And I'll be vetting you as well to see if you're a fit for the program, because I want it to be a really good fit for anyone that joins. Guys, this is a community and it's a competition. I break all these men up into small teams that compete based on their own goals and their dedication throughout this program. So if you're looking to level up to, to, to get more physically fit, to get your mental clarity uh, improved, to work on your personal habits, uh, to work through some addiction problems, all of those things are addressed at some level within the program. And guys, I'm going to scroll down here. This is it. These, these are examples of guys that have joined. You can play any one of these, but right there you can play tell you about this program and hear about the program. Guys of all height, weight, ages have joined this program. Money back guarantee. So if you get into this program and you complete it and it's not what you uh, believed in, it's not what you thought you were going to get, I will refund your money. No questions asked. Actually, I might ask you a question or two, but but I will uh, I will refund your money. So Please, guys, check out Warrior MBS if it sounds interesting to you, and I'd love to chat with you. Again, warriormbs.com. Talk with Jeremy. Join the group. you got 45 days until we begin with round two. So I hope to talk with you very soon, and let's get rolling now with the next episode of J Slay USA. Good morning, Warriors. Thanks for joining us on the Warrior Profiles. Today, I've got the host with the most. You can see he's got the coolest background of anybody in the program that's ever done a profile. But Dr. John Diamond, thank you for joining the program, and thanks for uh, agreeing to, to come on this interview. Hey, absolutely. I'm glad, glad to get uh, fellowship with people like you and uh, and uh, Dr. Mark Sherwood, man, I'm using his using his kind of some of his health stuff and using your fitness program. Man, what a great what a great divinely inspired uh, show we had that one day. Really put those two together, and I'm feeling better than I have. To be honest with you, in probably about 15 years. Man, that that's that's awesome to hear. Um, and and just guys, what he's talking about there is Dr. Sherwood. Um, he's big in the in the health movement and the freedom movement. He ran for governor of Oklahoma. Uh, but he came on uh, John Diamond's show, which is called America Unhinged, and then I was booked right after. And, of course, I think he was talking more about food, and I was mm-hmm. talking more about the physical side and the energy and all that. And it, w- it was funny because Dr. John said right there at the end, he said, man, I'm signing up, which I've had hosts say that before, and then I never hear from him again. But you actually did it. So <laughs> thank you for being a man of your word. I appreciate that. Yeah, I think I signed up like five minutes after the show. I mean, I've been looking for something like this, be honest with you, and, you know, haven't haven't really had anything like this. And then the fact that you're bringing, you know, all of it together, body, soul, spirit, the whole the whole shebang. It's not just, you know, going into a gym and getting a personal trainer. There's, a you know, accountability, which is so very, very important, you know, spirituality. And then the fitness part of it is just win win. Well, very good. I'm glad to hear it. And I know you've already already lost a little bit of weight as you shared with me off camera. But let's get to know you a little bit. So I see you're you're uh, living in Pennsylvania now. Give us a little bit of your background. Who is John Diamond? Well, let me try to give you the Reader's Digest version here. Uh, born and raised in Columbus, Ohio. Graduated in 1983. Uh, got sucked into the whole sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Wasn't raised in a Christian home. Uh, my, my dad was Catholic. My mom was Lutheran, which nothing was spirit filled or, you know, there wasn't, I don't even think we went to church after like eighth grade, but got sucked into the whole sex, drugs, rock and roll thing um, early on in my life. 
I ended up going in the Air Force, spent eight years in the Air Force. By the time I got out, I was a full-blown alcoholic. I mean, functioning alcoholic. Had a job, was a lineman for electric company. I just went home and drank every night. And yeah bit of a heathen, you know, and then my brother invited me to a little small church where he got saved while I was gone. And after I'd burned my candle at both ends for a lot of years and realized there wasn't no happiness or joy in the life I was living, I just said, well, let me try something different. I went to church, got saved one Sunday morning. And a couple of years later, I was in, uh, in Bible college and 15 years later, I get my master's, my doctorate, and the Lord brought us to Pennsylvania from Columbus, Ohio, and gave us this show. So we're, we're looking forward to what the Lord has for us. Man, that, that's, that's pretty, pretty amazing because, you know, I, 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 from being a ball player and living the life, you know, traveling and drinking too much and partying too much and all that stuff, I did that too. Um, of course, I, I was a Christian during that time. Mine was that slippery slope where I slowly dabbled my toes, and then pretty soon I'm all in and I'm, I'm the party animal. Right. Um, but that, that being said, you seem to have a miraculous transformation being that you said you went to sun- church one Sunday, got saved, and then you were in Bible college only two years later. Now that a lot of other people may get saved, but it doesn't mean that they're in Bible college and now hosting a show and, you know, fighting for, for truth and freedom. So what, what, how has God led you since that time of salvation? And, and how long ago was that? Oh man, I was 27. Um, so I'm 58 now, as you see there on the screen. Um, yeah, I, got, I mean, everything, everything in Christianity is just about a step of obedience. That's all it is. That's what I've been teaching in my discipleship class. It's about A, B, C, D, E, F, G. If God calls you to do C and you say, no, I'm never getting to D. You're never going to, you know. So when, when I got saved, the first thing I thought was like, well, I should be doing something to help the body of Christ. But I didn't know anything. I wasn't raised in a church. And then a yeah. opening opened up on the in the sound room. And I'm like, well, I'm used to being a roadie for a bunch of rock bands. I'm, I'm used to doing this. So I'll go work. And, and I volunteered my time to do that. And then the Lord called me to, to teach the youth. And I'm like, I've only been saved a year and a half. What am I going to teach these kids? And he's like, you're going to teach them what happens when you walk a life without me. So, I mean, I had a living testimony. I'm not just up there being some religious figure telling, I'm like, guys, <laughs> if you do this, this is what's going to happen. And, you know, very first thing I started off was you can learn a lot from a dummy. Remember the old crash dummy commercials? I said, you can learn a lot from a dummy. <laughs> Everything God has said not to do, I did. And yeah. here were the results of it. So it was very real, genuine. The kids loved it because I was real and genuine and and just came out of that. Well, then... I did that faithfully for a little while, and then the Lord said, I want you in Bible college. And I fought him tooth and nail for about a week, (laughs) and then I finally kind of succumbed to it. And I'm like, okay, all right, that's what you want me to do. And uh, it's been been a blessing ever since. So uh, your family now with you in Pennsylvania, what's that look like? Yep, yep. My family, I got wife and four little boys. Yeah. eight, Eight to 14. Uh, they're all in a Christian school here. Our church has a Christian school. My wife teaches music, her degrees in music. So she teaches over at the school. She teaches music, teaches piano. Um, and then our kids are in a Christian school right up to sixth grade. And then they go to a co-op. We have a co-op right down the street from my studio, which is in another church. And man, the education they are receiving. I, I go over there and help out quite a bit. The education they are receiving is world class. I, I mean, I look at what they're being taught at 14 and, you know, I went through the public schools in Columbus, Ohio. What yeah. a train wreck the public schools are. Yeah. So, you know, th- th- this is where we're at. This is where we're at. God's got us in a on a good course. And we've just said yes every time God said to do something. I mean, I gave up a $100,000 a year job at, as alignment for electric company in Columbus, Ohio to move move out here and start this ministry and couldn't couldn't be any happier. Man, that's wonderful. Um, tell, tell us about the ministry and your show, America Unhinged, and what the what the goal and intent is. Yeah, America Unhinged um, is, so I wrote a book in 2006 called Fighting the Next American Revolution, which was warning people where we were headed as a nation. Um, and, I, and I show them how incrementally we just fell away from God, <laughs> you know, from the founding till now. Um, and, you know, I, I just said, you know, nobody wanted to promote it. Nobody wanted to talk about it. Everybody was just kind of ignoring it. And I, and I was like, Lord, why? Why is it the, the body of Christ doesn't want to work together? And he said this. He said, everybody wants to be Moses. Nobody wants to be Aaron and her. Mm. And I went back and looked at that story again. I mean, you realize, I mean, Moses couldn't have won that battle unless Aaron and her was holding his hands up. He said, I want you to be Aaron and her. I want you to find people just like I do with you and getting you on my show. Find people who are doing a good work, advancing the kingdom, 
um, get them on your show and just help promote help promote what it is they're doing, you know, that kind of the body of Christ concept. And that that's what I did. And just as a result and a blessing of that, my own, I don't even know what you call it, popularity or, <laughs> you know, yeah. the fact that more people know about me than they ever did before was just based on that whole, that whole being obedient and being a servant. And just, it's not about me. It's not about, you know, it's about, not about me being the Moses. It's about me finding the Moseses and lift their mm-hmm. arms up and see what I can do to help you and Dr. Mark Sherwood and all the people I have on my show. That's a really cool paradigm that God gave you. I, I know a lot of us, um, if you've been in ministry a long time, you'll, you'll hear that about, you know, well, we need to be a support. We, you don't always have to be the leader, you know, but at the same time that, that inner man, you know, our ego wants to be back, you know, in front. So that, that's a great reminder. Um, you mentioned the schools and, you know, right now it, it is so apparent in our country, uh, between trains derailing, we got earthquakes going on. We got UFO stuff. Like there's all the, these distractions, but you go to the grocery. It's also close to home. You know, the, the supply chain problems that the World Economic Forum was saying, you know, it's going to happen. What's happening? And food is expensive. School, if you're going to pull your kids out of the public schools, is expensive. Um, let's talk about that piece first. People are already stretched. And if you've got kids in the regular public schools and you don't like it, what would your advice be? Because it not everybody just has, you know, the thousands of dollars that it takes to just start a, going to private school, especially with multiple kids. Yeah, I mean, there are so many options. You can go to a website called Public School Exit. I actually had Public School Exit Week on my show, um, and they will do everything they can to get your kids out. It's Alex Newman, who is on uh, Lindell Report. And, I mean, okay. he's very, very well known. I'm gonna write uh, that public- down. Yeah, public school exit, and they will do whatever they can. There's there's Christian school stuff. There's homeschool stuff. There's one room schoolhouse stuff. There is so much that you can do nowadays that it, it, I mean, it is a whole lot easier than a lot of people think that it is. But I had a guy on probably about three weeks ago, and he said something that really hit me. And it's kind of been what I've been saying, but he really articulated it well. He said the public schools are the devil's youth group. And I have two kids in youth right now, right? A 12 and a 14 year old. And I was like, wow, that is powerful. Yeah, the public schools are now the devil's youth group. There is nothing Christ-like in there, nothing Christ-centered in there. Everything they're pushing in the public schools from homosexuality to transgenderism to mutilating their genitals to, you know, and I said it started clear back with evolution. Evolution, you know, is an anti-Christ spirit for the most part, teaching your, you know, this is what I tell people, you know, you, you take your kids and you sit them in a school for, or your Sunday school class for 45 minutes, you have them color a picture of an ark, you think that's going to compare to the 40 hours that they're being indoctrinated yeah. with this, you know, satanic worldview for the most part? I mean, that's what evolution is, right? Your Bible's a lie. Your parents are idiots. Your pastor's an idiot. <laughs> it's a fable. It's a fiction. You're a moron if you believe it, you know, and, and, and I did a whole teaching on that one day on faith. There's only one thing that actually can derail a person's faith, and that's doubt. And that's exactly what evolution does. It puts doubt in people's minds. So when you looked at Peter walking on the water, he was literally performing a miracle. And then he started to doubt and then he started to sing. Right. So you could have a kid that's walking in faith and doing good. And then you, you expose them to this nonsense and it starts planting doubt in their mind. And that's why we're losing like seven, eight, nine of our kids in, out of 10 in the public school systems. Yeah. You know, it's interesting when you talk about evolution, I was always, um, even as a kid, strong Christian, strong believer in the Bible. However, I was always very scientifically minded, scientifically curious. And whereas my parents, for instance, they didn't really, I mean, it probably bothered them that evolution was being taught in the textbooks, but it wasn't like the, this big deal. It was kind of like, Oh, you, you know, just say what you got to say to get the grade, whatever. Right. Um, but for me, it was like, okay, no, 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 no. You've got the Bible on one hand saying this, and then over <laughs> right. here, you've got something saying that, that, like you said, it makes the entire Bible, if it's true, completely foolish. The, but, and yet you're sending me to this school where I'm supposed to learn this. Like it just doesn't, doesn't fit. So, but for a long time, um, I tried to marry those two ideas and people right. like Francis Collins, if you know who that is, he was the head of the, um, the NIH actually working with Anthony Fauci. He was a big proponent and not to go on a, a, a rabbit trail here, but this may speak to somebody. He was a big proponent of marrying his Christian. He was, you know, he claims he's a Christian and he goes around and speaks, but marrying his Christian faith with evolution, putting it together. And it was called BioLogos. 
for a long time, I tried to buy into that and, but, but it diminishes the power of God in such a big way. And then come to find out, you know, Dr. Uh, Francis Collins, you know, he resigns not too long ago. And we find out he was taking all these, all this money from big pharma to promote the vaccines uh, behind the scenes. And it's just like, gosh, the, the truth is coming out in so many ways. And so much of the science that for a long time I wanted to lend credibility to because it just seemed like, oh, all the big institutions say it. It's got to be true. Right. But yet you see these people can't even define what a woman is anymore. I know. So I didn't mean to go off on that, but 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 I am uh, a lot less uh, likely to believe those things than I ever used to be in the past. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I follow, I follow a lot of creation science. And I mean, it's basically believers that are, <laughs> that are scientists and, you know, and they're giving you the alternate, the alternate uh, views of it. I mean, back in the day that, you know, Hey, we live in this three dimensional world and everything evolved out of pond scum. Science doesn't even believe that anymore. Uh, yeah. Francis Crick, the guy that discovered DNA said there is absolutely no way this could have evolved. It's like a computer operating system, you know, so they know it. They, they know that it's a failed theory, but uh, one of the guys that, that did, did a foreword on uh, the evolution book um, said there are only two, there are only two explanations, evolution or scientific or, or special creation. He said, uh, you know, evolution has been proven false for years, but I'd rather believe a lie than believe in God. I mean, that is really what it comes down to right yeah. there. Well, they come up with all these, you know, far out theories about be, us being seeded by aliens and otherwise. But again, that doesn't explain life. It would just say, how somebody came from this other galaxy, whatever we, right, <laughs> we right, go on and on. Right. Yeah. It just pushes the plant, pushes the problem off the planet. Is all there you does. go. So we don't really have to answer it. We just know like how, anyway, <laughs> um, you, you were telling me about this initiative that you have, and I believe you told me on your show and maybe mentioned it, uh, since then kind of like a training school for, for, is it for young people or for anybody in terms of theology? <laughs> Right. Yeah, it's really for everybody because nobody's nobody's trained in discipleship anymore. And I mean, nobody, the Bible colleges, the seminaries, pastors, elders, deacons, nobody's trained on discipleship. They don't even know what discipleship looks like. They don't even know what the model looks like. Um, so what I what I do is I take the Bible actually gives us three models for discipleship and, and, and I teach all of these. So what this is going to be called is Peacemakers University. I got the website up. There's really nothing on it yet. I'm just starting to teach it and then we're going to populate it. Uh, but it's going to start, you know, it, it's based off Isaiah 28, uh, 9 and 10. You know, how do you instill wisdom? from those who are just pulled from the breast? No, it's got to be line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. So it basically starts with Christianity 101. <laughs> if you don't know anything about anything, it brings you in and then it systematically walks the believer through the three three levels of Christian maturity. That's what most people don't even believe. There's three levels of Christian maturity. Well, it, once you understand that, now you can start searching the scripture for what it says to this level, this level, and this level. Wonderful. When, when do you think that's going to go live? Um, I'm hoping to start putting some videos up here very shortly. I've only been teaching it for two weeks, so I kind of want to have a, you know, maybe about six weeks of material to fall back on that way. You know, if I miss a week or I get sick or I got to travel or something. So I was trying to build up a little bit of a library there to, to fall back on. And then I yep. want to try to release something every week. Awesome. Well, I look forward to that. I'm going to include your America Unhinged website. I know that that's probably the main place people go to watch your show, right? Yeah. America Unhinged Radio.com is the actual website, but okay. it's on Brighteon TV. And we've got like 59 hosts over there. Dr. Alan Keyes is the only one that actually comes from the studio. The rest of us are remote like I am here. Got it. Cool. What would you say, because you're in this world um, and you're in the fight for Christian men like who are in this group, but they're looking around and they're seeing all of the uncertainty and they're thinking about, you know, potentially in times kind of things. And, 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 and if the, you know, cause it's my question to you as well, but on behalf of me and, and them, they'd say, Dr. John, what, um, what should we be doing and focusing on right now to lead our family well in these times, not knowing what's really coming next? Yeah, I mean, we just, you just got to continue to have faith in God. You know, the word of our testimony, we love our lives not unto death. I mean, to me, that's one of the biggest things right there. That's actually part of the discipleship series because the Bible says that Jesus is both Savior and Lord. And too many people make him Savior, and that's the e kind of the easy thing because it didn't cost you anything anyway, right? <laughs> he gave you the gift of faith and you become slave. It's a whole different thing to make him Lord. 
And that's what Romans 12 talks about. It says, offer yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. And, and you know, what's that look like? Lord, whatever you want me to do, wherever you want me to go, even unto death, I'll follow you. And when you, when you, when you have actually made him Lord, and I'll do whatever you want, wherever I want, th then all the pressure's off, all the stress is off. I've put myself in your hands, you know, what comes, comes. And you, you really don't have to worry about it. I mean, you don't have to worry about anything, quite honest with you. I mean, I left my job two years ago, right, with a wife and four kids. And I'm like, Lord, I've got four kids. I got a family to provide for. And he's like, who provides for them? And I'm like, <laughs> all right, yeah. never mind. You know, I need to know you as Jehovah Jireh. I need to know you as the Lord, my provider. So just knowing God, just, just having that intimate, daily, personal relationship with Christ where you are totally, absolutely surrendered. You know, when, when you say even to death, I'll follow you. I mean, that, that really is the key. I mean, you yeah. don't think Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said that? I'm going to obey you even unto death. You don't think Daniel prayed that? You don't think Jesus Christ prayed that? I mean, that really is the key to victory is just when you offer yourself as a living sacrifice, you give himself 100% over to him. I'm going to do whatever you want, whenever you want me. And then I'm, I'm trusting you to take care of the rest of it. There, there's no pressure there. There's no stress. So we're coming in a time right now in the in the world where we're going to need that. We're yeah. going to need 100% total reliance on God. And that only comes by experience. So you have to start that walk. You know, you have to start that walk with him. Consider Abraham. Remember, Abraham wasn't given the test to sacrifice his kid. You know, if he would have been given that test first, he'd have failed. First, he said, hey, go, go and leave your family. And he left. And then he's given another test and another test. And it all builds up to the big test. Right. That's Same with cool. Israel. Yeah, they were tested cool. 10 times in the they were tested 10 times in the wilderness and failed. And then when he said, go take Jericho and oh, we're like grasshoppers. And they said, you're not getting the <laughs> promised land. So, yeah. I mean, life life is about knowing him. It's about being tested and you will be tested. Israel was tested. Jesus Christ was tested. <laughs> you will. Abraham was tested. You will be tested. And when you pass that test, you move on to greater levels of glory. And that's where the power is. Man, that's that's a that's an awesome reminder, and I love that idea of God's bringing you the test that you can handle to to build your faith over time, so that when the big test comes, you're re you're ready. That is awesome. Yeah, I mean, think about just in my own life when Abraham left, he said, "Leave the land," right? But what's it say in the very next verse? Because the chapter ends, and we don't sometimes catch it. The very next verse in the next chapter it says, "And the famine in the land was severe." When it w he didn't walk into some big blessing, he walked into a famine. Right. And, you know, he had to be going, man, did I make the right call? Did I make the right decision? I got a family. Same with me when I left my, you know, very lucrative electric company job and moved here, you know, and the only thing I had was like a fourteen thousand dollar a year part time job at FedEx. There wasn't enough there to but it was a test. And it was just like, look, I know this is what you've called me to do. I've never had a second doubt about it. You know, you're going to have to provide. And then he provided, yeah. you know, and then when COVID hit, he told me to quit, quit that job. You know, where I was up to making another good 50000 a year. He said, quit that job and start this show. Here we go again. So, I yeah. mean, if I wouldn't have passed earlier tests, you know, then I would have never had the faith to, to pass this test. Absolutely. They're big on the rapture, you know, and then uh, so many pastors that I know, where I grew up, at least it's huge. There's something in me. There's like a catch in my spirit. I don't know what it is. I've even thought, is it sin that I just don't see that as what's going to happen? It's not. I see it. Okay. I mean, it's not. It, there's it's, so many, there's, like, like, there's so many big time pastors that I respect, like Jack Hibbs, for instance, out of California, rapture, 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 you know? And I'm just like, I, I, I just feel like there's going to be a second coming. Yeah. Yeah. There, I mean, there is the, the whole, the whole, uh, John Darby, that's where all the rapture came from back in the 1850 with his dis dispensationalism and everything else. That's pretty much what everybody's bought into. That's what that's what everybody, I mean, I don't care what denomination you left behind series and all that. They think Christ can come back at any minute. He can't. There's still too many prophecies that have to be fulfilled. I just said that Sunday. You know, one, one thing is the church has to come together in unity. Is the church together in unity? No. Not at all. I mean, Jesus prayed five times that the church would be one. <laughs> You know, is is the father going to leave that that prayer un, unanswered? No. When you look at the fivefold ministry in in Ephesians, what's it what's it say? He's given the fivefold ministry to bring us to unity. I mean, just read all of Ephesians four. It's all about unity, unity, unity. So the church, 
the church is going to come together in unity. That doesn't mean every denomination is going to throw off their stuff and sing kumbaya. But when Christ comes back, there's only going to be two groups, right? The wheat and the tares, the sheep and the goats, the righteous and the unrighteous, children of God and children of the devil. And this is what we're seeing right now in the world is this polarization where people are kind of polarizing into two groups. And it's it's going to be very, very clear. But yeah, the the whole pre-trib seven-year rapture of the church thing, that's just, it's, well, it's pre, not pre-trib right. Pre-trib seven-year right. tribulation, right? That, yeah, that's what they they teach. There's going to be a seven year tribulation, yeah. and before the tribulation, the rapture happens. Yeah. And oh, I grew that, up with it. And there's still prominent guys like Jimmy Evans. He had marriage. You know Jimmy Evans, the pastor. Mm-hmm. So he has the Marriage Today ministry, and I benefited greatly when I was struggling in my marriage from his Marriage Today, right? right? right. And then he kind of shifted into the Hal Lindsey, you know, left behind, uh, uh, you know, a rapture then tribulation sort of talking all, you know. And I've read his book, and he's got some great points that he makes. There's no doubt about it. Um, but I also, the more I've learned about uh, the Schofield Bible. Mm-hmm. wasn't that a really popular Bible in the late 1800s that came out? And that was a big push toward American, especially evangelicalism, leaning toward uh, ra- the rapture theology. Yeah. But but why why is that necessarily wrong, though? Other, other, I mean, I, well, I guess you already said not all the prophecies have been fulfilled. But, I mean, they point to Scripture as well. Right. Right. That's the key. I, I actually got a course. I actually got a course on my Peacemakers University. It says Revelation. I haven't even pop, populated it yet, but um, that I'm going I'm to be kind of doing the same, the two simultaneously. But OK, so here, here's the thing. And, and this, I mean, this is just a deep, 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 deep dive that we'd never cover here in these five minutes. But if there's a seven year period in the book of Revelation, where is that seven year period? Where does it start? Revelation chapter 11. All right. So it's not at Revelation 1 before the seals and the trumpets. Right. This is what they teach. So so the current theology is the whole book of Revelation starting when when he says, come up here. Right. That's the rapture. That's the beginning of the that's the beginning of the seven year tribulation. Mathematically, that doesn't even make sense because it says that the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11 will prophesy 1260 days. That's three and a half years. All right, they're killed in the streets of Jerusalem, and then they're taken up, and then it says, and then the woman is protected 1,260 days. From Revelation 11 to Revelation 20, there's your seven-year period right there. I mean, you just do the math. You, you can go back a little further and it says the people are tormented five months and all of that. So the seven-year period starts when the two witnesses start. And that is not something that anyone's taught because they don't want to think that we've that we got to go through the seals and the in the and most of the trumpets. But I mean the what what we're doing, big picture, what we're doing is when we transition from the Old Testament to the New Testament, right? We tend to think the cross is like the break point between the Old and the New Testament. That that wasn't right. That's actually not right because there was actually a three and a half year overlap a transitional period. That's when he started his, when he got baptized for three and a half years, they were in a transitional period between the the two covenants, right? Sure. And that's what he was doing. Kind of like a president. President gets elected on November 20th, but he doesn't come to power to the 20th. So what's he's doing? He's putting together his team, his transition team to take the reins of government. That's what happened in the Old Testament. They were given the keys to the kingdom. They weren't faithful. Jesus said the keys of the kingdom will be taken from you, given to a nation bearing the fruit. That's the church, right? But there was a three and a half year period where he was calling and training his apostles that they could hit the ground running. That's exactly what's going to happen in the book of Revelation. So there's you got the church age and you got the millennial age. And this is what people forget. They forget there's a millennial, there's still a thousand years to go after all of this, right? So you have a transitional period between, uh, it's what I call transitional dispensationalism is the big theological word, but you have a transitional period between the church age and the thousand year reign of Christ. And that's what Revelation chapter 11 is with the two witnesses. It just, it mirrors Christ's ministry when he was preparing. Well, what happens at the very end of the three and a half years? The seventh trumpet is blown, the last trumpet, and it says, now the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. All right. And then you get into the Revelation 12. I mean, that that's it. There is a rapture. That's where it's at. And it's only actually a partial rapture. There's only you have the woman, the man child and the remnant of her seed. Those, that's the church. 
right? Is that, is I that mean, the part about, about you... being caught up in the air with the Lord? Is that what you're referring to? Okay. What, what, if I want to study on this more, what's the best resource to, to, that you would go to? Because again, if I, if I just type in a, a pastor's name that I respect to pick, you know, what do you say about your eschatology or end times? They're landing all over the place. They really are. I mean, people yeah, don't realize. Yeah, I think the American Christian thinks, well, everybody believes in a pre-trib, you know, rapture and all this. But a lot of a lot of pastors behind the scenes have even told me, like, that's not actually what I believe, you know. Exactly. It's what their chairs believe, so they have to say that. No, um, the Revelation series that I'm going to be doing is probably the only place. See, the Lord had me go to three different Bible colleges, one for my bachelor's, master's, and doctorate. So I was able to get all of this stuff and kind of get these pieces of the puzzle and put it all together in a way that I think actually fits. So that's what I've given you. I There's probably only one book or one ministry that even comes close to that. Um, I could actually send you the I can actually even just send you the PDF. I think I have the PDF of the book of Revelation. Yeah, um, and, and, and by the way, it's not that I don't trust you or what you have to say. It's just the more, you know, other voices that can verify, it, it just adds more, you know, depth and credibility to it. I, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I mean, when he says in, Reve in Revelation 4, 1, he says, come up here and I will show you the things that have to take place. Everybody says, oh, that's the rapture. No, that's him telling John, come up here and I'm going to show you what's going to take place. That's, that's all that is, right? So from that day on in the year, whatever that was, 100 AD, any of that stuff could have already happened, like the like all the, the seals opening up. I mean, all of that stuff has already happened in the Middle Ages. So when you look at the, uh, po uh, the horses of the apocalypse, all of that stuff's happened with the Black Plague and the uh, Crusades and all of this. So if we're, if we're thinking this is all an end time stuff, the beginning of the seven years and all this stuff's going to happen, and we're not really considering the possibility that what if all this stuff already happened? What if, what, you know, what if a, a, a third of the people dying, the Black Plague killed a third of the people on the planet? Yeah. So what if that seal, you know what I mean? No, so it's just I, I do. And, and it just, it gets messy because there's guys out there that I respect like Doug Wilson. I like, I like, you know, Doug Wilson from, uh, Say okay, so he 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 does great commentary on what's going on in culture and relaying it to the Bible, but in and and his eschatology he calls it you know a hopeful eschatology of the um, he he's a post millennialist so he believes that we're in the golden age of the church and you know there's going to be ups and downs but overall we're we are going to be prepared as the bride of Christ and when he returns we're going to be victorious um, we're going to be victorious to prepare for his return. You know what I mean? Like almost like we, we get to win, then he comes. Um, but I, I don't know why I brought that up other, other than to say, there's just people I really like that land in a lot of different camps on this, exactly. this issue. Exactly. Yeah. Read, read, read revelation 11 and then 12. And now in 12, it says this, right? There's three groups. There's the woman, the man child and the remnant of her seed. Who's the man child? Everybody wants to say Christ is the man. Oh, that's the man child that was taken up to the throne. Everything in the book of Revelation is for, is in the future from 100 AD on. That, that's not talking about Christ. That's talking about the mature saints, right? And then you have the woman. That's the bride, the remnant of her seed. So only the man child gets raptured. Only a specific mature overcomers actually get raptured. The woman is protected for three and a half years. The rest of them get killed by the Antichrist. Now, again, here's here's where you got to go a deep dive into hermeneutics because Jesus gave a couple examples. He said, as it was in the day of, of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Well, ha what happened in the days of Noah? You had Enoch who was raptured. You had Noah who went through the flood but was protected. And then you had the rest of them who died. Yeah. That's the same. That's the same analogy over in Revelation 12. The man child is raptured right when the two witnesses are raptured, you know, and then you've got the woman who's protected 1,260 days, who's nourished, who's provided for. And then yeah. you have the rest that's just turned over to the Antichrist and they're going to die. So, I mean, it, it's a pretty deep dive. One, one thing that would be cool, um, and I'll have to jump off here, but as you get this this uh, curriculum built out, Keep the whole group informed. I mean, there some of them will watch this, and I'll encourage them to. Um, now, I don't mean this part. I mean when we were recording earlier. Right. But right. Um, uh, yeah, as you get that built, especially this stuff to do with end times, because more. I mean, I'm interested, and in more and more people are thinking that we're there. 
So they, they want to hear, they want to, they want to know, you know, who to trust and get some biblical wisdom. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, if you don't even understand the feast, you can't understand the end times and we don't teach the feast because, oh, that's Old Testament. We don't need the Old Testament. No, the Bible says the Bible says in first Corinthians that everything was done to them was done as an example to us. So, I mean, as it was in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Lot, I mean, you, you have the exact same thing. I mean, you have the journey of Israel, right? The journey of Israel, they were saved by the blood of the lamb. When, when does the journey of Israel start and end? Well, it starts at Passover and it ends when the temple is built and the glory of God falls, right? That's the journey of Israel. That's the bookend of Israel. Take that forward and into the new in the church age, and the church age is just going to repeat that. We're saved by the blood of the Lamb, right? That they, they went through the first feast with Passover and the resurrection, and then there's a long growing season. Now we're still waiting for the last three feasts to be fulfilled, which is the rapture, which is the Christ coming and being glorified in the saints. That's what the last fe feast was. So again, it, it, it's a pretty it's a pretty deep 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 dive sure. that I think. I mean, the Lord told me to write it when I was on my honeymoon. I got up, I got up at 5 a.m. on St. Lucia. I was on my honeymoon. I'm just reading the book of Revelation. Okay, here's the backstory. When I did Revelation in seminary, they were like, look, here's all these different views. We're just going to share them all with you. And they're like, we don't care which view you take, just support it. So I was just like, I'm not going to rack my brain on this. Sure. I said, maybe I'll follow this up some other time in my life. So I graduated. Um, I had my master's, I had my doctorate. I'm done with all my education. And I said, you know what? I'm really going to pour myself into just studying this a little bit better. And that's when the Lord was like, you need to write a book on this. And I'm like, wow. So it, that's what the teachings are going to be is just the stuff that, that I wrote down. Um, but I had zero desire to take this on just because, like you said, there are so many different. If, if he wouldn't have told me to write it, I wouldn't even write it. I wouldn't even try to teach it. I mean, that's how. Yeah, it's big. That's how deep, deep, deep this is. I mean, you have to understand a whole lot of Old Testament stuff to even understand New Testament stuff. And that's why we're in the condition that we're in. Most of the church is pretty much ignorant of the Old Testament. Or if they're not ignorant, they don't understand how it applies to the end times, right? So, yeah. you know, there's there's three feasts that still have to be fulfilled. And that's what you see right there at the end of Revelation chapter 11. The last trumpet is the Feast of Trumpets. Right. And then it says, I looked into heaven and I saw the Ark of the Covenant. Why is that even in there? Why is that information there? Because that's the Day of Atonement. Right. The Day of Atonement was the only time that the Ark was ever seen by anybody. Once a year, the priest went in and came out when the curtain was open. That's the only time you ever saw it. So you have the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and then the ingathering or the rapture. Those were the last three feasts that took place on a 15 day period. So we're waiting for that kind of 15 day period to take place. And all of this stuff is going to happen kind of bang, bang, bang. So yeah. it's pretty deep, but it's pretty good. I, I think yeah. I'll get started on that. <laughs> well, man, uh, best of luck. I know that's, that's big. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's a ton of stuff. But, I, yeah, I'll put my mind. The Lord already told me you're not traveling a whole bunch this year. This is really going to be about content creation. So I'm going to do the Revelation one. That'll pique a bunch of people's interest just because, you know, everybody loves, you know, have a class on Revelation and the place is filled. Have a prayer meeting and four people show up. Sure, so everybody yeah. loves everybody loves Revelation and they love to hear about what's new and everything else. So I'm going to be working on creating both of those here real shortly. That's awesome. Well, Dr. John, thanks for for doing this this morning. I've enjoyed it, and uh, yeah, let's let's stay. Let's keep continue to talk and catch up. Yeah, yeah, without a doubt. All right, I'll talk to you soon, my friend. Thanks, my brother. See ya.